Turn to the book of John, chapter number 21. Once again, it, it really is a privilege to be able to come back, see some the same folks here. I, I hear y'all have got some folks sick. I say I'm missing a couple faces that I know. But uh, in all honesty, we, we go over every year uh, in July over to, there's a church over in Powell, Tennessee. It's called uh, Temple Baptist. They have a Bible college over there, the Crown College of the Bible. Great college. And there are thousands of people that come to that church, Temple Baptist Church. Great church, Brother, Brother Clarence Sexton. Um, actually, one of his boys is going to be preaching at the Mission Point Jubilee. But it's a great church, but it has thousands of people. And one of the things is you don't notice if somebody's not there. Here, you're a family. And that's what we need to be. That's what we are, is a family. And we need to take care of each other. And that's why I love whenever you all come up here and you have prayer requests and the kids get up here and sing, all of you are just family. That's all it is. And, that, and that's what the church needs to be. And I'm proud to, to be able to come up here and see you folks. I'm proud to be a part of Grace Baptist where we have a family there as well. But the truth of it is, is we're all in the same family. We're all in the family of God. But that's a commercial. That has nothing to do with this. John chapter number 21 I'm going to read several verses, so bear with me, but I, I believe this is important for us to, to get to where we, I believe God would have us to go tonight. John chapter number 21, starting in verse 1, says this, After these things Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and on this wise showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus, and Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two other of the disciples. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They said unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. And when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? And they answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw in for the multitude of the fishes. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girded his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were two hundred cubits, dragging the net with fishes. As soon then as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals where the fish laid thereon, and bread. Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land, full of great fishes, an hundred and fifty and three. And for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Jesus saith unto them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then cometh, and taketh bread, and giveth them, and fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples. After that, he was risen from the dead. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, I thank you for saving me. Dear Lord, I thank you again for the, the true honor to be able to stand before your people and bring your word. Thank you for the blessings that you've given me today. And dear Lord, I thank you for those that have come out here tonight. Pray that you'd open their hearts, and dear Lord, I pray that you would work through me, that what needs to be said would be said, and that it wouldn't be me talking, but it would be you. Dear Lord, inspire me in some way that I could give your people what they need here tonight, dear Lord. Dear Lord, I pray that your will be done in all we say and do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This is, of course, the tail end, the very end of, of the book of John. This is after Jesus has risen from the dead. It says right there that this is the third time that he showed himself to his disciples. This is a portion of scripture that we don't come to very often. Brother John used this a little bit in a reference this morning. I actually had something planned else to preach tonight, but I believe God wants me to preach this, in all honesty. And I didn't have a title to my message until just a little bit ago, when she was up here trying to climb up onto the stage. And Miss Tabitha got on to her, and she turned around and was like, what? what did I do? I didn't do nothing. What, me? So the title of my message is simply this. What did I do? What did I do? You've all seen the little kids when they do that, when they know they did what, something they weren't supposed to. I did it. I, I still do it. 
I didn't do nothing. You know, I was saying one of my favorite shows is the show Cops. And they can catch this guy red-handed. He's like, I didn't do nothing. I didn't, I didn't, I, I didn't do nothing. That, that, that's not my pants. That, that, these ain't my pants. Can't you tell? We've all, we've all seen this. We come up with so many excuses to explain why we do something. And right here is a prime example. These men are sitting around doing nothing. These are disciples of Jesus Christ, which is what all of us are. But yet they're doing nothing. They're just sitting around shooting the bulls, just, you know, just doing nothing. And the thing about it is, these men already knew what Jesus wanted them to do. They already knew it. Jesus makes it a little bit clearer whenever he goes up into heaven over in the book of Acts, chapter number 1, verse 8. Go down through the whole verse, but it says at the very end, go into all the world and preach the gospel. That's what they were supposed to be doing. That's what all of us are supposed to be doing. These men knew exactly what Jesus wanted them to do, but yet they weren't doing it. In verse number 3, an interesting statement is made by Simon. This is Peter, Simon Peter. Saith unto them, I go a fishing. Now, I picture Peter as just this old country boy. That's how I've always pictured Peter. Whenever he speaks and they have direct quotes, he never speaks proper English. Grant, he was speaking Greek at the time. But he never speaks proper English. And we'll see later on, he's got some strength on him. But the thing about it is, he makes this statement, I go a fishing. I go. How many times have we stood and we know what God wants us to do, but yet we say, I want to go do this. I want to do that. Peter knew exactly what God wanted him to do, but he said, I want to go do this. It was something that came natural to him. It was something that was easy. You think about it, there was four different disciples. You had, I, I wrote them down so I wouldn't forget them. You had Peter, Andrew, James, and John. All four were fishermen. That was their profession when Jesus said, hey, come follow me. Hey, I'll make you fisher of men. It was natural for Peter to be a fisherman. He knew how to do it. Why is it that we always pick the easy way out? Always. I'm guilty just as much as anybody. We want to do stuff that's easy, not necessarily what God wants us to do. And right there it is. I go a fishing. Now here's the thing. There's a statement, and I've heard people, and, and I'm just going to be honest with you. I've heard people that will go out here and get drunk, because I've talked to them, and they say, my drinking only affects me. That is a lie. 180%. Because I've went, and I've seen wives that were beaten by their husbands because they were drunk. I've seen children that ain't been fed in a day and a half because their dad's been drunk. Your choices affect other people. What happens in verse number 3? Simon Peter saith unto them, I go fishing. What did they? They say unto him, we also go with thee. Now these men, these are, however many disciples are there, they said, they knew exactly what Jesus wanted them to do. But Peter said, I go fishing. It takes one person to turn people away from God. One person. Peter said, I'm going to go fishing. And they said, hey, we'll go with you. One bad apple will spoil the bushel. Now, I'm not trying to say that Peter is a bad apple. Because you read throughout the rest of the, the epistles, and Peter, <laughs> he, he did some preaching on the day of Pentecost. But the thing about it is, one weak moment in our lives, and we can take so many people from where they need to be. It's our responsibility to take care of ourselves, but it's also our responsibility to take care of other people. Now, we are not responsible for other people's actions by any means. Everybody makes their own choice. But you are still affected by others all the time. Older folks, there's a lot of kids in this building. Praise God for that. Thank you, parents, for bringing your kids out to church on a Sunday night. 
Thank you. I know it ain't easy. But here's the thing, parents, older folks, these kids are looking up to you. Not just physically. They're looking up to you. They need some leadership. Because let me tell you, they ain't getting it in school. They need a church. They need a family to help them out. They need to have a family to show them which way is right and which way is wrong. Because the world sure ain't doing it. But one choice that you make out of God's will can affect other people. Now, I could stop there, but I'm going to keep going. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. So here it is. You got four fishermen. They know what they're doing. They go out all night long, and they go fishing, and they don't catch nothing. Now, back in those days, they didn't have fishing poles. They had a big old net on the side of a ship. Now, I ain't the brightest apple on the tree, but I do know that if you got that big of a net, that you could probably catch at least one fish all night. I mean, good grief, shoot, I've, I, watched, <laughs> I watched Elliot Nard take out and shoot a fish with a rifle. Skip the fishing pole. But here's the thing, you have a big old net and you didn't catch one fish with people that know what they're doing. Hmm. hmm. Maybe something's wrong. Verse 4 says this, But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, No. Now, I just sort of picture Jesus sitting there, they're next to this shore, and he's, he's looking at it. The Bible says later on that they were about 200 cubits, which is about 100 yards. So picture about a football field from the shoreline. It's not real far. So he can see him out there. He's pulling in the net, pulling it back. And I just sort of picture Jesus just standing there all night long, just watching. Because it was dark. They wouldn't have been able to see that good. And I just, I, that, that's just sort of how I picture it. And Jesus was just waiting for them to give up and say, hey, this is not what we're supposed to be doing. I've told this story before, but I remember my dad, I'd be working on something, and my dad would be looking over my shoulder. And he would never say, hey, do you need a hand? Do you need help? Now, unless I was fixing to stab through my hand with a screwdriver like I did one time. But he, he just sort of sat back and watched. And he let me make my own mistakes. And then whenever I'd turn around and say, hey, Dad, can you give me a hand? He'd go, sure. And he'd step right in. What was he waiting for? He was waiting for me to ask. He didn't want to feel needed, but he was waiting for me to realize that I needed him. That needs to be in our lives every single day, to realize that I can't do this on my own. I need God. I need my Father. Failure is one of the best ways to success. Because you won't learn nothing if you always do stuff right. God's going to let you fail. But you know something? He'll grab hold of you and he'll pick you up and say, keep going. I'm right here. But now here's the thing. I just, I, now this is, I have no Bible on this, but I believe that Jesus was just sitting there watching them fail. And then when it came morning, he just tells them, hey, did y'all finally catch anything? And I, I, I just picture all of them just screaming no. Like, we've been out here all night long. I'm mad. I'm hungry. I'm wet. I smell like fish. Uh, no, we ain't got nothing. Why would we still be out here if we had fish? But Jesus wanted them to realize that they needed him, that they were wrong. Now, let's keep going. Verse number 5, they answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. Now, I've already said that there's four fishermen on this boat. How absurd does this sound? That, that'd be like standing there and telling some of you hunters, Hey, you're, you're sitting here behind this, up in your tree stand. And you say, Hey, you know, just, just turn around. There'll be a deer back yonder. I've been sitting out here all morning, 
I've been calling for deer all morning, not one's answered me back. I ain't turning around. That's absurd. But what they do? They did it anyways. I, I can just see them just sitting there. It's like, should we do it? It's like, no, I'm tired. I want to go home. Like, no, let's just give it a try. And so they did it. They cast their four, and now they were not able to draw it in for the multitude of fishes. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, that's speaking of John, John's the disciple that Jesus loved, saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. It took them this long to realize that it was Jesus. A man that they had spent over three years with. A man that they had already seen twice after he had risen from the dead. And it took them this long to realize that this was Jesus. This was God talking to them. We say, how absurd is that? How many times has God told us to do something and we ignored Him? Now, I understand there's a difference between ignoring and making sure it's God. I'm going through some of them decisions right now, as I'm sure many of you are. We all have decisions that we have to make every day. But there are times when you know it's God and you don't do nothing about it. There's a difference between making sure and ignoring God. There's a big difference. Because there's times when God's puts that neon sign right up there in front of you and says, do this. It's like, is that really God? Is that really Him? Mm, maybe I need to think about this for five years and we'll figure it out. But look what, what Peter does. John told him, he said, hey, it's the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he didn't even look up. He's like, okay, it's it, okay. He gird his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, and then cast himself into the sea. Now, before we go too far, Peter was not completely naked, okay? We'll, we'll just clarify that right now. Back in those days, their modesty was uh, taken a little bit more seriously than it is today. But you had a coat that you wore. And basically what you had underneath was a t-shirt, and a pair of breeches, basically. That's the best way I can describe it in our terms. That would be considered basically your underclothes. You only wore that whenever you were actually working because it was immodest to just wear that around town. So he's out there working and he throws on his fisherman's coat because he still has a sense of decency about himself and he jumps into the sea. Now he's sitting there now, a hundred yards is a far way to swim, especially when you're fully clothed. I, I've swam in the river in blue jeans. It ain't easy to do. It's hard. So why on earth did Peter just jump in and not wait for the ship? Because when he realized that it was Jesus, he wanted to go to him as fast as he could. Folks, there are times, many times, when you're going to realize that what you're doing is not what God wants you to do. So what do we try to do? We try to save face. We try to make out like, okay, you know, yes, this is not what God wanted me to do, but I don't want to admit that I was wrong. Because we want to take the easy way back to get back to God. Folks, we're all human. We all make mistakes. And I'm going to be honest, one of the worst things that Christians are today, myself included, is we're fake. We are. Because every time we come to church, we put on our church face. We do. We could be arguing the whole way to church, and you walk in that door and somebody says, How are you? I'm doing great. I'm glad to be here. I've just had a great day. God's blessed me all day long. And you get, back in the ha you get back in the car after church and you still go screaming again. You put your church face on. Why? Because we don't want to see pe people, we don't want to show people our weakest times. I'm just being honest with you. 
So many times we do that. And what happens whenever somebody else is going through a rough time in the church? They can't come to you because you ain't real. Be real around folks. I don't know why this keeps coming up, but we're all family. Let me tell you, you treat family worse than anybody that you will ever treat. You, were, you treat family worse than anybody else. That's what I'm trying to say. You do. <laughs> you want to know how I truly am? Go talk to my brother and sister. It's honest. Don't, don't, don't go down to where I go to school at and ask my boss. Don't go to Brother John and ask my pastor what I'm like. Don't go down to people that I played baseball with or people that anybody that I work with and ask me what I'm truly like. You go and you ask my family and they'll tell you what I'm really like. Why? Because I'm real around my family. So many times we're so fake. And what happens when we realize that we've done wrong and we're out of God's will is you're going to save face. And we want to take that easy way back to God. You know, maybe take that bypass around. What did Peter do? He realized he was wrong and he jumped in that water because he wanted to get back to God as quick as he possibly could. Now, I'm not down on these other disciples because as we go through, you'll see also that the other disciples, they took a ship and they came back. But let me tell you something. Peter was the one that instigated all this. Peter was the primary one that was responsible, and he wanted to get back to God as quick as he could. Now, let's keep going. Verse number 8, And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were 200 cubits, dragging the net with fishes. So they still got the fish with them. As soon then as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals, there and fish laid thereon and bread. Where in blue blazes did Jesus get fire and fish and bread? Hmm. Seems like I know of another story where Jesus had a miracle with fish and bread. Seems it's kind of familiar. What happened? Even though they were disobedient, God was still waiting on them. He still had something prepared for him. He still had supper ready. Jesus will never leave you nor forsake you. And right here is a prime example. Jesus has already showed up to his disciples twice. Twice. And they still ain't doing what they're supposed to do. So what does Jesus do? He shows up again, and he's still there to bless them. He's still there with open arms, ready to accept them back. Now, verse number 10, Jesus said unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land, full of great fishes, an hundred and fifty and three. And for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. There was a hundred and fifty three fish in this net. The Bible says that they were, they were pretty big. They say, okay, big deal. Here's what I want you to understand. First of all, Peter pulled that whole net of fish up by his own strength. We're talking about a strong man. Now, I want you to jump back with me a couple chapters. I'm not going to go there. Who was it that denied Jesus Christ after the Garden of Gethsemane? Peter. What did Peter do after the cock crowed? He went out and he wept bitterly. The Bible tells us that. Here's a man, and my, the best way I know how to put it, this is, a, this is a country boy. He's got some strength on him. This is a man's man, as we would say. This is the same man that went out and cried over his Savior because he denied him. I've heard this said, True men don't cry. You can think what you want to, but I got Bible to say no. All tears mean is that you that you got emotion. If you can't cry over somebody that's lost, 
You can't cry over some time that you've, you've denied Christ. I'm not saying physically saying, I, no, I ain't saved. But what I'm saying is by your actions. If you can't cry over that, something's wrong. Now, here's one thing that I want. If you don't get anything out of my, the message here tonight, I want you to get this. Jesus gave these men all these fish. Now, what they did with them, I have no idea. God blessed them with fish. Now, here's the thing. God will never curse you with a blessing. Now, let me explain. I do not have $5 million. I can promise you I ain't got $5 million. God did not give me $5 million, probably because I can't handle it. Now, what would happen to me if God did give me $5 million? He blessed me with that much money. I'm going to be honest with you. I would probably not be here preaching. That's human nature. Be honest with you. God would have blessed me with money, but that blessing would have turned into a curse because it pulled me away from God. They say, where do you find that in Scripture? God gave these men all these fish, but that net did not break. A fisherman's way to make money, and the way that probably still some of these men still ate, was by using that net to catch fish. God did not bless them to the point that their net broke, that they could no longer live. God will never give you more than you can handle. And we always talk about that with temptation, but that's also talking about blessings too. God will never give you more blessings than you can handle. Because let me tell you, it would be absolutely wonderful if you could have 3,000 people in this building. But this building couldn't handle it. And in all honesty, it would almost turn into a curse to have that many people here right now. So what does it do? You do it over time. Not just show up and 5,000 people sitting in the parking lot. God will only give you what you can handle. And God will give you the strength to handle that. Now, let's keep going because I know it's getting late. Verse number 11. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land, full of great fishes, an hundred and fifty and three. And for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Jesus saith unto them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou? Knowing that it was the Lord. How did they know that it was Jesus? Because they saw him before. Have you seen Jesus before? Has Jesus appeared to you? Now, I'm not talking about in a physical sense, but what I'm talking about is a time when you know that God was talking to you. Has that happened? I hope and pray it has. If you're saved, it's happened once, at least. And I hope, it, I hope it's happened to you many other times. These men knew what Jesus looked like. Why? Because they had been with him. Many times, and I'm guilty of this as well, many times we're not sure if that's what God wants us to do, because we ain't been close enough to him. There are times when a child will be away from his parents for five, six, even seven years. And that father or that mother will show back up and the kid ain't got a clue who they are. How long has it been since you've seen your father? He's sitting there waiting on you. You have to make the choice to go see him. Now, verse number 13, I'm almost done. Jesus then cometh, and taketh bread, and giveth them, and fish likewise. Verse number 14, this is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples. After that, he was risen from the dead. I've said this throughout the message. He's already showed himself to his disciples twice. This is the third time. How many times is it going to take 
God showing himself to you till you realize what he wants you to do. So many times we think about this, that this message that I've said here tonight is for young folks. It's not true. I'm going to use Miss Verna as an example. She's going to the Philippines. No offense, ma'am, but you're not 19. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm sorry to give you that shock. I was the first time. You were. <laughs> there you go. But here's the thing. It's never too late. I heard a story of a man. He was a young guy about my age. He was talking to a man. He was about 75 years old. Took him out to Cracker Barrel to go eat. And as they went through, of course, you know, you, you go through and you see the store and it takes, you know, a little while till the, the waiter with all the stars on her apron come over and take your order. And they were just sitting there talking and the man was going to be a missionary and I don't remember where, what country it was. 75 years old. And the young man looked at him and he just he said, I, I got to ask you a question. Why are you going at this age? The man leaned across the table. He moved to syrup and the candle and he moved that little whatever game with the golf pegs and everything else out of the way. He leaned across that table and looked at him and he said, because young pups like you won't go. You are never too old to serve God. Never. Ever. 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 I remember an old preacher. He was talking to a lady. I, I forget, we were at a nursing home. And a man was sitting there talking to him. He said, you know, I just feel that God's done with me. And he looked him dead in the eye and he said, are you still breathing? God ain't done with you. As long as you're still breathing, God's got a plan for you. There was an older lady, and it was actually down in Livingston Regional Hospital. She hadn't moved for five, six days. Hadn't moved an inch. And one night, there was a nurse that went by this lady's room. And I'm going to lay down here real quick. She was laying down in her bed. And all of a sudden, she just leaned up. And she reached up. And she said, take me home. She fell backwards and she died. I tell that story for this reason. That lady still had a breath in her. And I can still tell that story because it affected that nurse. Now she never actually took her Bible and showed that nurse how to be saved. She never showed her through the Romans road. But because of her testimony. Because that one thing that she did, she put a lasting impression on that nurse. And I can still remember that story. So she's made an impression on me. An older lady on her deathbed, still making a difference. And here's what I want to tell you. I'll actually get back to my notes. These disciples saw Jesus three times. He was with them for three years. There are people that never had a full copy of the Bible. There are people that never saw God physically, and yet they gave their life for Him. We call them martyrs. You go to Fox's Book of Martyr and read some of those stories. People that lost their hands, they lost their feet, they were burned at the stake. Some of them were beheaded, all because they believed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. So many times, over during the reign of Nero back years ago, Christianity was illegal. There were people that were dipped in candle wax, put up on poles, and burned to death. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just simply telling you fact. And all they were used was to put in Nero's garden at night so that he could have light to walk around. Hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands of Christians died. There are more Christians being killed today than at any other time in history. And yet we can't even take a gospel track and leave it in the bathroom. We can't take a gospel track and leave it at work on the lunch table. 
because we're afraid somebody might get offended. We're afraid of what people might say. The Bible says over in Acts chapter number 17 that the disciples turned the world upside down. God gave them a boldness, and He gave them the Holy Spirit. What's God given us? The Holy Spirit and boldness. We got the same stuff that these disciples had. What's different? Us. Now, I'm not, I'm not down in nobody. That's not what I'm trying to do. But what I am saying is there are people that are still dying today. There are people that are having to meet in churches underground, don't even have a full copy of the Bible, but yet they will testify and they will share the gospel with anybody in their country. We have the freedom to go out on the street corners, take our Bible and just start reading, and the law can't do nothing to you. What's the difference? Us. Has God showed up to you? So, back to the title of the message. What did I do? What did I do? What are you doing for God?